Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Speak Up and Empower. This is Christine Merriman of Traumas Peace. I'm an expert in assisting people with the aftermath after with the after effects of traumatic experiences. And I help them conquer them through creativity, writing, and thorough guidance in every aspect. You can get my free book, Creativity Conquers Trauma, Overcoming Negative Self-Talk, at bit bit.ly forward slash free slash ebook slash negative slash self slash talk. <laughs> and my guest today is Steve Garvin. And Steve has been an accountant in his life, but he gave it all up because tell us about that. <laughs> Why did you give it up? Why did I give it up? Yeah. I gave... Well, let me start back a little bit further. So accounting was kind of the pinnacle of my career. I yeah. kind of um, meandered after getting my undergrad, which was actually in marketing, and had worked as a salesperson and so forth, and that didn't fit right. And I just kind of worked my way into both intentionally and accidentally into accounting eventually getting my master's degree and spending quite a bit of quite a few years in the accounting world i've always had a, a propensity for numbers numbers come easily to me and they tend to make sense <laughs> <laughs> You're a lot better than me. I have complete dyscalculia. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, but the particularly the work environment that I was in did not feel like home. In fact, it felt mm -hmm. quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of events that happened such that I continued to fall deeper and deeper into a pit of despair, a... Uh, a real sense of depression and i've had have had dealt with depression since i was at least a teenager so it wasn't new to be dealing with depression but the depths at which mm -hmm. i dealt with depression were more severe than i've ever encountered would you mind going back to tell us a little bit about your original family my original family sure yeah what would you like to know? Well, you said you dealt with depression as a teenager, and that indicates to me that thing was not correct. Yeah. I, my, for me, a, a lot of my struggle with depression was more genetic than uh, huh. environment. Although I think there was a certain amount of environment too. My family was, my dad particularly, was quite the perfectionist. Everything had to line up perfectly. And so there was a lot of suppression of, of himself, which translated into a suppression of myself. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of freedom, which ultimately was really the the main cause of of my difficulties so there was i think there's some genetic components to it but there's also um, some environmental components to it is there anything with a spiritual background <laughs> yeah well definitely a religious background um mm -hmm. we were all raised in the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and oh had a very fairly strict uh, set of standards by which we lived our lives, which was both really supportive and also really challenging. And I'm still active in that faith, but mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> take things a little bit differently than I did back then. For one, I give myself a whole lot more grace and freedom than than i ever did before that's good and the same thing with dad dad had a lot of struggles himself <clears throat> honestly both my parents did my mother 
lost her father, who she was really close to when she was only 13 years old. Mm. Ooh. <clears throat> and then when needs she, her dad. Right. And then when she was in nursing school in her 20s, her mother's diabetes became really bad. I think she lost her sight. I know she ended up in a wheelchair. I know she was having all kinds of, you know, in, internal organ problems. Mm-hmm. So mom had to drop out of nursing school in order to be her mom's nurse. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Dad was I'm also nervous. suppressing his sexual orientation. Mm. He actually came out of the closet when he was in his late 50s, um, which, of course, yeah. changed things up in, in our yeah. in their marriage and in our family. And yeah. although it was never something that we really talked about openly it was just kind of okay that's what dad's doing and whatever um which i really regret now that we didn't have more conversations around that well you know it was the silent century and it pervaded even into this one which is very much more noisy but you know people just didn't talk about those things right we had no vocabulary for it and it was very difficult so now i can see why? I mean, I, I'm just sitting here connecting dots and I can see even why this affected you when you were an accountant and how you you finally just knew you had to stop. Right. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? What it was like when you did you have a plan or was there any <laughs> a plan for what? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't act like me. When I started tender, I had. It took a while. Actually, my to you. I'm not getting your question very well, but I will try oh. to answer it. Yeah. Um, I had two plans. One, I had a plan for my exit strategy, which was uh, and a disclaimer and warning that if you are triggered by talk about suicide, then um, I'm going to talk a little about suicide. But I... Towards the end of my time in corporate accounting, I was so sick of it, literally, that I ended up getting whooping cough. Ooh. And I would cough so hard that I'd black out. And when, so I, I was given some prescriptions. When I returned from being off for about a month, because again, I'm, I'm, I'm coughing so hard that I can't function. Um, my boss was not happy that I had taken that time off, was not at all understanding about what I was dealing with. So when I returned to work, she didn't speak to me for three days. And when she finally did speak to me, it was to pull me into her office. And there was an HR director. And my boss read me a long list of all of my quote unquote infractions at work which sent me spiraling down even further into depression. And I felt honestly worthless and mm -hmm. felt that my family was better off without me. And so my intention was to end it all. And fortunately, my wife knew what was going on, hit all the medicine in the house, and I went and... I was not de deterred by that. I called the the pharmacy close to work and got my prescription refilled. I later learned that my wife had called our neighborhood pharmacy and told them to not refill any of my prescriptions, but she did not think to call that pharmacy up by work, which is about a 45-minute drive away. And minutes before I went out to, the, to pick up my prescription and to 
uh, exit stage left, I was in the restroom and I heard a voice that said, don't use a permanent solution to solve a temporary problem. And I'm like, okay. And that was enough to, to push pause on my plans there. So those there were those plans. As far as plans as to what I was going to do next, I really didn't know. Although I had begun to uh, explore my creative expression. Mm -hmm. I was have always written. I mean, that's just been a pretty much a constant in my life. But I began to do some graphic design and playing with some of the tools that, where I could do that. And one of the interesting things that came out of that is I, I created this spiral and then I put like all my roles on that spiral. So, you know, father and accountant and husband and whatever. But mm -hmm. at the end of that spiral was the word healer, which was a, came a, totally as a surprise to me because I did not see myself as a healer. I did not know what that meant at that time. Did you have one of those, why didn't I think of that moments? <laughs> well, eventually, not immediately. I love those moments, yeah. It took me a few years to realize, okay, well, maybe I am a healer. But I had to go through my own healing first before I could ever recognize myself as, as being a healer for other people. Of course. Um, but when I was given my pink slip of opportunity a few months later, uh, First of all, I was elated, but it also I found myself out in the creative wilderness wondering what the heck I was going to do with my life. It's kind of like... Mm -hmm. Stark. It might be, you know, when, when you're confronting the blank page, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what am I going to put on there? And is it going to be any good? And I don't mm -hmm. even know where to start. And I mean, it, it's just this uh, kind of disturbing, kind of exciting time when there's all this possibility and all this anxiety and because i was, had dealt with the, the trauma that i was dealing with at that time not only did I, was i exploring my creative expression and by the way one of the first things that i did within a few months after leaving corporate was um did these masks that i have behind me uh, just kind of exploring yeah Exploring one, the, the medium of, of paper mache, but also later, much more recently, I've realized that that the message from those masks, not only are they masks, which, you know, kind of hide or they both hide our, our who we are, but they also present something different for us, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it's, I find it interesting at this point now that they're all bird masks. You know, yeah. maybe what I was looking for at that time was was the opportunity to fly and to, you know, and also maybe the the whole idea around birds of a feather type of thing. And, and just the one of the things that I love about nature and expression is just the great variety of expressions that are out there. You know, so there's all kinds of birds with all kinds of colors and you mm -hmm. know, all that, which I find. All kinds of sizes. <laughs> right. All kinds of demeanors. <laughs> which I find fascinating. And, and so uh, while I was trying to explore who I am and, and how do I, how do I move forward, but also how do I deal with the, the trauma that I've been experiencing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do I resolve that? Yeah. And over time, and this took, this did not happen over a weekend. It did not happen over, you know. I get it. It, it. it took literally years for me to navigate through that dark place. Yeah. And to be completely transparent, I'm still dealing with it to, to some degree. Well, you but, know, it's, it's honestly a lifelong process. Because and my little art is peel make it stitch it into that we can use that quilt because that quilt is us 
Mm. And really, there's no better support we allow for self to receive. And, you know, I, I thought they had a life, but then when I got into researching for this new career, which is so different than being a full time professional artist, yet it's so similar mm. in many, re many respects, I've learned so much more. And so when my son came for my birthday this year, he said, Mom, you know, why are you still talking about this? I said, because I've learned so much and it's changed me so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just I understand very clearly. I'm also the mistress of the masks. I mean, I've had 10,000 masks because I could never show myself. I mean, in mm. my life, I've been looking at it like this from sure. way deep inside of me. And everybody, you know, says all these things about how I look. And I, I just don't see it. I'm just mm. way, way back yeah. in there. But getting rid of always having a mask is another huge process. It is. It is. And and it's an ever-evolving process. Yeah. You, you know, I remember a few years ago, I set out with the intention of kind of figuring it all out. Within a, and my expectation was that I'd do all this journaling and so forth and and have it resolved within a matter of months mm -hmm. well it's it's been years now and i'm still working it out i mean I, i'm much more clear now mm -hmm. and but it's still a process and yeah. honestly it's one of the things that i love about the work that i do is is this opportunity to discover and to you know pull back the mask and see you know what's back there and, and how do we how do we present ourselves what is it that we want to be creating yeah so how did you how did you how did you find writing to be beneficial in in any way aside from just you know for your personal therapy how did you break out into sharing mm. with others mm. that's a huge element it, it was well. and honestly it really scared me yeah um, i'm still scared of it <laughs> yeah well me too honestly um, oh good i'm so glad i just <laughs> Because that perfectionism that that I kind of lived into or uh, uh, inherited from my father, and I'm sure he, he wasn't the beginning of it either. Yeah. Uh, but, and I have such a passion for words. I love language. And, you know, I spend most mornings learning a little bit of Greek and Spanish and German and, and wow. so forth. And I also, you know, dive into the dictionary and, and that type of thing. And it, it, language is just something that, that fascinates me. And I, I love to, to learn not only the words themselves, but what's the history behind the word. Yeah. And looking in that and exploring that world and, and doing my, I've written nearly every day for the last, uh, gosh, how many years has it been? eight and a half years, some approaching 3,000 days, it, uh, it began as just kind of, an ex of a self-exploration. And eventually, it took me, I don't know how long I'd been writing before I actually started sharing it more publicly, but it took me a couple of years to get to that point. And when people started to receive what I was sharing and they got value from what I was sharing that that helped me in a couple of different ways. One, it helped me to value my own voice more fully, but it also helped me to, to refine my voice because it, you know, when we're sharing our story, not only are, is there our experience and our uh, expression of that story, but it's a co-creating experience because the audience as we share it and they respond to it and they point out certain things or, or get certain ahas from yeah. what I'm sharing, it enriches what I'm creating and it becomes a collaborative experience rather than just a, uh, you know, the, the writer in the tower type of experience where I'm isolated from, yeah. from my audience. And it's also one of the things I really like about speaking is the immediacy 
of connecting with other people and, mm -hmm. and and having that instant response. One of the things that I've started to do in the last couple of months is write some poetry, which has brought me back to, you know, is this any good? And, you know, will people like yeah. it and whatever? And uh, yeah. so I started to share a little bit of that and to develop my practice around it so that it isn't just a one-time, yeah. you know, well, one what time I wonder. did, <laughs> right. But it becomes a practice that, an art practice, you know, just like any other kind of practice like that. Yeah. So. I Tell us about your business then. What is your business name? And how did you start that? When did that happen? So my business name is Gifts in the Gold. And the my what that means, and it took me actually, you know how you have these opportunities to introduce yourself to these different networking events and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing that, but I was also getting some coaching from getting some coaching from friends, coaches. And everybody seemed to be resonating when I finally landed on the words gifts into gold. And I'm like, this is really cool. I love how people are responding to that. I just don't have any idea what it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you don't, you know, <laughs> how do you expect to uh, let others get it? <laughs> right. So I, I actually started another one of my daily practices was I'd been going on daily walks for a while, years, and I began the practice of just speaking into my phone, into the, the voice recorder on my phone. And when I began, I was just exploring those words, just let's figure out what gifts into gold means. And the, I had a sense of what I meant by that. It's, you know, take what, take your gifts and to figure out a way to create value with those gifts. What I, where I'm at with it now is that our gifts are all the experiences we have in life. You know, they're, they're the trauma, they're the delights, they're the, you know, all the things that make for a richer story. And when we own those stories, when we get really clear on who we are and what we're expressing in the world, then we can, as I like to say, be the bright light in someone's dark night, that we can create these beacons of hope for others to to navigate their own dark nights, our own dark forest. And so my business is helping people, helping my clients, my audience to appreciate and to value their unique story to see how their story can help other people. So my focus is on helping other authors and speakers to get really clear on the story behind what they're doing and also to figure out what is the best way to express that story so that the value can be most fully realized, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like, in, you know, any other kind of artwork where, you know, you can throw a bunch of paint on the wall um, and some people will, will get that. You know, I'm thinking of Jackson Pollock or, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other artists and, but that's not, not everybody resonates with that, that <laughs> form of expression. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting clear on, well, who am I? Who is my audience? And what is the message that I'm trying to convey to them so that they can get to a better place, a richer uh, place in their lives and in their business? So how did that, where did, where, when did the story architect come into being? <laughs> that came into being a couple of years ago. After I was, the gifts into gold. Yeah, it did come in after the, the gifts into gold. Mm -hmm. I was looking for a title for myself. I wasn't comfortable with CEO. I wasn't comfortable with, you know, various things that I'd been calling myself. I was actually at that time before I uh, came upon the word story architect. I'd been calling myself the mindful marketer, um, but I realized I really wasn't, marketing wasn't my primary uh, value add. 
And so I was looking for something that fit me better. And I remembered, well, first of all, I, I knew I was working in the world of story. So that was not too far of a, of a stretch or too much effort to, to land on that. But where architecture comes in is that I have always been fascinated by architecture. When I was a, a teenager, maybe even younger, I would ride my bike around town looking for all the cool architecture. And then when I spent yeah, some time... what town that was? Sure, it was Eugene Springfield, Oregon. Ah. Yeah. So there was, I remember this one street in particular, and I don't know how it worked the way that it did, but it was, there was a lot more interesting, diverse architecture along that street than anywhere else in the area. And so I would ride my bike over there with my friends and, you know, we'd, you know, go riding up and down the hills and <laughs> there was a bike riding aspect of it, but there was also just, you know, I, I loved being around this really interesting architecture, Yeah. you know, and I fell in love with people like Frank Lloyd Wright and that type of thing. And then a few years later, after I'd gone down to for a training in San Francisco and, and spent some time around the Presidio and the Palace of Fine Arts and, you know, the Painted Ladies, the, uh, you know, just all the- Which are the Victorian homes. Right. By the way, yes, the, everybody yeah. knows. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that. Um, okay. But I, I just fell in love with all the, the architecture there. And, and so yeah. on a, almost on a whim, I took the $150 that I had in my pocket and, and moved to San Francisco. Wow. And motivation. <laughs> motivation. Maybe at that time you could do that, you know? Well, because I don't know if anybody could do that today. Well, the San Francisco is still super expensive place to live. It's even more <laughs> expensive. That's what I'm trying to say, it, really. It, and, it's even more expensive now, yeah, yes. Yeah. But even then, it was dramatically more expensive than anywhere else I'd ever lived. So $150 did not get me very far. Mm -hmm. But I moved in with some, made some, through the course that I've been taking and some connections, I, I found an in-law apartment that I could stay at and was able to get a job First of all, I just did some temp jobs, but then I got a job as a waiter on Pier 39, uh, which is a whole nother story. Um, <laughs> other than to say I was on Pier 39 when the 89 earthquake hit in Ooh. San Francisco. Yeah. So that was an experience. I remember that one. <laughs> because really we, had, we that. had one in L.A. about two years before, maybe three years before that. Mm. And um, I, you know, that was the last that I participated the one wasn't okay go on with so i in re calling my passion for architecture i found that it it would actually pretty well describe what I was trying to do with story in that, you know, story isn't just something that we share about the past, but it's also how we create the future, you know, based on our past experiences is how we, is the, are the building blocks by which we create our, our life going forward. And so it seemed to be a, a good fit to change my title to the story architect and only recently, like within the last couple of weeks, I added the abundant story architect because it's really about, you know, how do you create, use your story to mm -hmm. create a more abundant life mm -hmm. for yourself and for the people that you're serving. I'm so glad you like architecture because I came from just southeast of Madison, Wisconsin, and Frank Lloyd Wright came from just west of Madison, mm. and Georgia O'Keeffe came from just north of Madison, <laughs> and then, of course, Liberace came from Milwaukee. <laughs> really? I did not know that. Huh. Yeah. So uh, Madison is a very architectural city. It has yeah. a big universe. The whole city is situated basically on isthmuses between five rather large lakes. It's very mm. beautiful. 
And because we had Frank Lloyd Wright there, every other architect came up there to mm -hmm. show their stuff. So the whole city is just full of really interesting architecture. And then it took, I think, 65 years or more after Frank Lloyd Wright had died for the city council to pass the building of one of his big buildings, which sits right on Lake Mendota. Mm. And it's beautiful. It goes up from the lake all the way up to where the, the state capitol rests upon a pinnacle of, you know, it's not a big hill, but it's a hill because sure. the, the, the capital, our capital models, the United States Capitol building. Mm. And um, it really, it's so beautiful when you're driving in along that lake to just see this pink building. It's just really, yeah, huh. it's really nice. And my father was attended the school there, of course, for law. And he was a, um, uh, what do you call him? He was a smart kid. I mean, he was in the, um, uh, my mind is going blank. What do you call it when, when you have smart kids in, in a fraternity? So he was in the, uh, an mm. honors fraternity. Sure. And it was built by, I can't remember who. I'm very bad with names anymore. I'm sorry. I am 70. But um, his building, it was just a home, an, ex, a, an enlarged home. But it had all of these beautiful angles and gables and everything on it. And I, I can understand where your architect comes from in, in terms of story building, but it's so nice when you really understand architecture too, mm. because it's, it's, it's how man has expressed himself since we were on earth. Mm. You know, it's very ancient. And I really like the name abundant story artist, architect. I think that's just perfect. So what do you do in your business? Do you, do you, how do you how do you run your business? What what kinds of things do you do in your business? Because you're a speaker and a writer. Right. I know you're a member of Toastmasters. Yes. Yeah, member and club president and founder and all that kind of thing. So I'm pretty heavily invested in Toastmasters. Well, it's a wonderful organization. It's it been is forever, and and I'm I just, just delighted you. with the people who've shown up in the club that I started at the beginning of this year. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do write, I do speak. I also, the, the revenue generating portion of the business is one-on-one -on -one coaching as well as group coaching, helping people to get really clear on the story that is at the heart of the business that they either want to or are running. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that, you know, when we get really clear on what that story is and what we're trying, you know, when we, in the beginning of the story, you know, we start out in, in one point and we, at the end of the story, we're at, at a different point, you know, and, and as transformational authors and speakers and coaches, you know, how do we people, how do we help our people get from this point to this point? How do you and, bridge that gap? Right. And with, for me, and that story is that bridge story is yeah. that journey from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. And getting really clear on what that story is and, and how do we, you know, remove the friction? How do mm -hmm. we express ourselves best so that we deliver the value that we want to be delivering? So we create the difference we want to be creating. And so my, my work is helping people to get clear on that story and to be able to share that story clearly so that their audience can easily navigate from where they are to where they want to be. <laughs> Excuse me, just. <sighs> you said, you told me at one time that your father made a complete transformation in his later life, that he be, it actually changed his nature. Yes. How did that affect you? Did it did it help you? Did it ease you? Did you learn anything new from it? Oh, very much so. Uh, first of all, Dad did like in a lot of ways. I'm kind of mirroring Dad's life in yeah. that you know he suppressed himself in so many ways for so long that when he finally began to express who he was and to pursue his passions for art and for, uh, you know, he was a watercolor painter. Uh, he was 
fascinated in learning. He grew up in the in the Depression and moved around a lot while he was growing up, such to the degree that by the time he had graduated from high school, he was at best a remedial reader. Um, but by the time I was around, he you know had gotten a college degree. He uh, was an avid reader and a diligent student. So there was that oh, aspect of him. What a transformation! Yeah, and the and not, but it wasn't until I had graduated from high school myself, uh -huh. and Dad had uh, begun to express and be more open about who he was and his identity. Mm -hmm. um, that and started to take classes, auditing classes at the University of Washington, where they were living at the time, in art, and started to explore that side of himself that he really began to open up. And we, for the first time, really began to have a relationship. Because prior to that, he was just so focused on, on getting things done that mm -hmm. you know, we, we didn't did not have much of a relationship growing up so it wasn't until i was an adult that he started to that we started to really relate with one another and there are a couple of pivotal things that happened for me in that relationship <clears throat> one <clears throat> i remember really clearly being on the boardwalk <clears throat> around the puget sound and then the, the sun was just beginning to set and it had all those wonderful uh, sunset colors. And the way that dad, he just stopped and just, you know, was really present to what he was seeing and started to describe the colors that he saw in the sky. And, and I could tell that he was seeing something, even though we were looking in the same exact area, we were standing right next to each other. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. through his artistic eye, he saw things that I didn't see. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't like I just suddenly saw. My eyes weren't just opened at that point. Yeah. But but it began to to present the idea that that there was more to to the world than what I was seeing. And so I, as time went on. One of the things that I studied when I was in doing my undergrad was art history. Uh, you know, I, for the longest time, I was uh, my approach to art was as more as a consumer, as an observer. I did not feel that I had the skill or the, the ability to create my own to express myself. So, but I could appreciate those who were able to do that. And so one dad opening himself up and starting to study and spend time there, but also in, in doing so, he also began to do some watercolor painting, which, you know, I thought was really amazing. I still didn't feel uh, free enough to do anything like that myself. Mm -hmm. But then, when how old are you? How old? How, how old? What was well, this, is, at this time? This was in my twenties. So mm -hmm. when this was, most of what I'm talking about happened. Mm -hmm. And then twenty years later, when Dad passed away in 2013, um, you know, I, I had just been laid off, gotten my pink slip of opportunity at work. Um, wow! What time? And, Dad, I got it. I was living here in North Carolina. Dad was back in in the in Tacoma, Washington, which is just south of Seattle. Yeah. Um, and I'd gotten a call in the middle of the night from a surgeon saying that Dad had fallen and they'd had surgery that morning and thought things were going well, but they it turns out that they weren't going well. And they, I was told that if I wanted to see him before he passed, that I needed to get out there in the next, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I flew out there the next morning, spent the last few days with dad. He was in a coma. So, so I'm, I'm really glad that I was able to be there. We did not have any kind of dialogue because dad was unconscious. But, but I remember when dad passed that it was just kind of a watershed moment for me. 
in that I realized how much distance I had put me, not only physically, I mean, from Washington mm -hmm. State to <laughs> North Carolina. It's about as far away as you can get. Yeah, it's about 2,400 miles. But also, I had vowed early on in my life that I wouldn't follow in the same footsteps and that and the way that that showed up at that time was that I did not want to pursue, uh, did not want to live the the starving artist life that, that dad had, had largely lived. And so that's one of the reasons I went the corporate accounting route because it was a whole lot more lucrative for me and more immediate than uh, more of an expressive career. Dad never made, dad literally never made any money from his art. Uh, it was always just a, a pastime. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the century that he came from because um, we weren't necessarily valued as artists. It would deter you from the career, but there were, there were, and many people just can't sell their artwork. They, they think that, that that's selling and they don't feel because making it, it's such a personal experience. But when you realize that other people want it and are happy to share their money with you, to have the experience of having your art in their home, it changes everything. Mm. But it's so hard to get to that point. Yeah. So realizing how much distance I'd put between myself and dad also helped me to see how I could change my life so that I would be more in harmony with his legacy. Um, and so that was when I, I'd already begun to, as I said earlier, had begun to explore my creative expression, but dad's passing helped me to do that to an even greater degree. Yeah. <clears throat> really, I can, I can understand. A parent is, they're, they're always, either a, a guardian, a protector, or a nemesis, <clears throat> or a, a perpetrator, um, and sometimes a great mixture of every possibility. Right. And when a parent passes and you're suddenly on your own, it can be quite shocking to the whole system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and then if, Four years after dad passed, mom died, and at I was a 50-year-old uh, orphan, which was an interesting experience. So, Tell us about it. Why did you feel like an orphan all of a sudden? Well, I mean, literally, I am. I don't, I don't have any parents, and so... Well, I know. I mean, we all, we all get there. I mean, right. you know, we all get there, but I just, I wanted to... Because it, it, you seem to have maybe had some special reckoning or understanding to to deal with. Mm, yeah. Well, it was just, I, I guess I had taken my parents for granted, you know, mm. that my relationship with my parents and... Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm, I knew that they were going to pass at some point, mm -hmm. but knowing that that's going to happen and having it happen are, are two very mm -hmm. different things. Mm -hmm. And Did realizing... You feel abandoned? That, no, not really abandoned. Just, I didn't feel abandoned. Uh, just disconnected. Uh, that's like, I, didn't, I didn't feel like <laughs> they uh, intentionally, you know, left me alone. Mm -hmm they it was time for them to go and honestly both of their passings was a beautiful experience but the the phone calls that i had had for decades you know on sunday evening or, or whatever or you know after dad passed i moved back to tacoma and spent you know mom's last four years of her life i was mm -hmm. largely her um, mm -hmm. caretaker mm -hmm. And so there was an immediacy that was there. And just, you know, these are people that have been with me all my life, you know, mm -hmm. people that, that knew me from before I was Day even one. born, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and there was, 
some comfort to that and then not having them there and realizing after the fact how many conversations that I didn't have with him that I would love to have had and that I don't have, would not have direct access to having those conversations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we can all put them into a chair and pretend they're there and talk with them and work out a lot of our stuff, but right. there is nothing like, and that's, that's why I, when I, when my mother called me on January 2nd of 2007, 20 times, not realizing she'd just called, I knew that she may not have too many cogent minutes left in her mm. life. And that if I wanted to find peace with her, I had to be there. Yes. And I immediately, I mean, I mean, I didn't immediately go home because I had to do a workshop in Hawaii, which was beautiful. But mm -hmm. when I went home, <clears throat> you know, I realized first that she had no relationship with my big brother who was living with her he had moved back from china he was a linguist mm. with parkinson's and she and he really had never had <clears throat> what i would call a quality relationship mm. he was the number one child and so i had to work with that and then it took me another four years of going back and forth i mean it was a thousand miles door to door mm. and you know it might have been even worse for you if you were going back and forth across the country right but it's it's so important to be there and it and and at least you did give her conversation and you know just nurturing and things like that at the end of her life so that that was probably a more complete feeling than perhaps when your father died my father died rather quickly um so I went home when I realized that my mother had been up for four or five days and nights. And mm. I just, I called the airport, got a, got on a plane that day and went home and woke up at three o'clock in the morning, came kind of, I made a lot of noise coming down the hallway just so they would know. But I had, I heard them arguing for the first time in my life. Mm. They, they never argued in front of anybody. Huh. And I was shocked but i could understand because i know for all of us one of the deadliest hours of the day is between three and four in the morning mm. and this was when i got up at three o'clock and my mother was just frantic and my father was upset and you know i i came and so but at least i had i think two and a half days with him then and my mother actually did go she didn't want to go to bed she you know she just went into the kitchen and made herself i think a cup of tea but at least she got out of the, the way and there was a distance between them and somebody knew was there it was me and everything came to a rest i don't mm. know what my father was upset about i you know i didn't even ask mm. but it took us another four years before the moment happened and um I was able to find peace and it was very transformational. And I'm very grateful that I spent that time and that money. I don't care how much it cost me. I mean, I spent literally every penny. I, I, came, I came home once and I all of a sudden I realized that I didn't have anything, mm. and, you know? So it's, it, our parents are really important in our life and, and they're very, you know, they are there for the reasons that I believe we chose them to be our parents. Mm. And so, you know, I think that you, I salute what you've done with your, because your parents are so in you. I, I can feel them there. Mm. And I love that. And I hope that people will understand that I don't hate my mother and I absolutely love my father. He was my saint. But, mm. you know, I really want to express through them, because you know, every trauma is multi generational. Mm -hmm. Every trauma on earth is multi generational. I found out that my mother had been abused. I found out that my father's mother had been abused. I found out that my niece had been abused. And and I hope that I can bring this to an end in maybe my generational line. Or maybe if I can't do that, at least I can help the, the world get new eyes because we are now in a noisy, vocal century. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's. Yeah. I salute that, and I I am right there with you. And, yeah. Yeah. You know the work that we're doing is trying to heal the 
the pain that is present. Yeah. You know, and if we can help make the world a, a brighter place, just a little bit brighter, uh, you know, and, and create that that cyclical experience where where each of us are are being are creating light rather than diminishing light, that the struggle that we're that we see around us will um, you know will dissipate. So what are you most grateful for right now in your life? I am just really grateful for all the wonderful people that I have in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people like you. And you know, I'm yesterday afternoon I met with the presenters for the the summit that I'm holding again in November, which is a Sing Your Heart Song Summit. Mm. And just, you know, having these people come together that, you know, are are sharing their heart song with the world that are right. trying to help other people to find and access and express their own heart song. You know, I think it's just a, um, I'm just so delighted to be part of that. You know, I'd, and one of the reasons I'm so grateful for that is because I spent so many years doing this job that I was, you know, pretty well compensated for and pretty skilled at, but also so disconnected from i mean i i remember writing you know just looking typing in my browser window board.com and you know just, I, was just, <laughs> I was just so yeah. not um fulfilled by what i was doing yeah. um, and now i'm just so richly rewarded for what i'm doing that that it's just a really sweet experience so Will you please now, because we're, we're, I'm sorry, but we're at the end of our hour. Will you give us the name of your business, the name of your Toastmasters Club? Have you written a book ever or? I am in the process of writing books. Okay. I'm... Well, then give us the name of your business again and the sure. name of your, of your Toastmasters group so that other people might join you. Sure. So my business is Gifts into Gold, and I'm found at giftsintogold.com. Um, I also have a Facebook group, the Art of Entrepreneurship for Transformational Authors and Speakers, of which Christine is a member, and I appreciate all that you contribute there. Oh, I and appreciate you, let me tell you. <laughs> my Toastmasters Club is the World of Difference, which is for coaches, authors, and speakers who want to make a world of difference in the world. We meet every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time and are always looking for new people to uh, join us and to make a, a greater difference in the world. Well, thank you, Steve, so much for being here with me today. I really have enjoyed this conversation. You've given us a lot to think about. I think everybody has crossed the paths that you've crossed. We've come to those junctures where we have to make a decision. And, and I like how you've handled it through creativity because that's my thing too. Yeah. So let me thank you once again, Speak Up and Empower, for allowing us to have this hour of great conversations with people who have used creativity to conquer their trauma. This is Christine Merriman from Trauma's Peace. You can get my free ebook on negative self talk at bit.ly.com forward slash um, creativity conquer. I mean, sorry. Free ebook, negative self talk with little dashes in between. <laughs> I'm going to shorten that by next week. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I celebrate you and your life. Bless you. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>